Welcome everybody from Kigali in Rwanda today. My name is Martina Fuchs. I'm a business journalist and a reporter working for the Chinese news agency, Xinhua. I would like to say a big, big thank you, first of all, to our analysts uh, joining us from all uh, continents, from all corners uh, in this world. Some getting up really late, um, getting up really early, and some staying up until really late. So appreciate your efforts today uh, for this Horacio USA meeting 2022. It's going to be a very fascinating and interesting debate. Um, so please, everybody in the audience, join actively, ask your questions, participate. We want this to be a very dynamic 45 minutes of panel discussion. Uh, the topic uh, of our session is climate change solutions versus organizations inertia. This is a very important topic, of course, because we need to get active, take actions uh, to tackle climate change, um, not wait any longer, especially after COP26 and a lot of promises being made. So without further ado, I would like to introduce now our panelists. Uh, first of all, we have Sunday Adeocho. He's the co-founder of BioDry to Energy, um, based uh, in Switzerland at the moment. Uh, then we have Ben Croft. Uh, he's the CEO of Central Nick uh, in the United Kingdom, but joining us from Australia today or tonight, rather. Then we have Moon Therine. Uh, she's the founder of Doctrina and is from Finland. Then we have Frédéric de Mevius, uh, he's co-founder and managing partner of Planet First Partners uh, in the UK, but uh, currently in France. Then we have Kai Monheim, he's the director of the Center for Multilateral Negotiations in Germany. First of all, um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask you for a very quick uh, one-minute opening statement on the topic of our discussion. May I start with you, Sunday? Yes, it's a great pleasure to be here again uh, on this uh, channel. My name is Sunday uh, Martin Sadeojo. I'm the vice president of BioDry to Energy and also the chairman of the global company worldwide. I was born into a royal family in Nigeria in a village called Ileife. And our company transformed actually waste into valuable uh, energy or resources such as electricity, that's our can can uh, program and also into cement as i told you before and we help provide shelters also for for needy people around the globe and we also meet uh, at least nine of the united nations sdgs uh program uh my education line is engineering and also sport when i say sport i said football and table tennis Yes, that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunday. Uh, June, may I go to you next? Can you hear us? I think there might be some connection problem. Uh, we had some Wi-Fi issues. Can you hear us, Moon? Yes, I can. Okay. Please take it away. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, such a pleasure to be here and having this discussion with all of you today. My name is Moon. I'm the founder and CEO of um, Iendry. It is actually an organization I just founded back in January this year. And it is about climate change, exactly what we're talking about, and organizations in Asia. So last year, I was a chief marketing officer of a fintech impact company. And my job was to and my business was basically into the carbon credit space and how large organizations are tackling the issue of this carbon emission, how they see and foresee that they can change and they can contribute to that. Just right around the time when the COP26 happened, we have witnessed that when, when I talk to people who were running billion dollars company versus people you know, who are educated people like you and me, like I'm making an assumption you know, they're living in these fabulous cities that you would make an assumption that if you had the money, that you would be willing to contribute to the mitigation of the climate change. But to my surprises, what I found out that that was not actually the case, that what our assumption was, and even though you know, when I spoke to people, they say that, yes, you know, I think the world is in trouble and I wish I knew what to do, but I really don't know. Um, 
And whenever we gave them an option that maybe you can buy a carbon credit to be able to offset your footprint, what we saw that when it came down to paying the actual money for it, people were not interested. So after Christmas last year, I thought about then how do we actually solve this problem? How do we go from a climate change narrative to a climate readiness or an art readiness? How does the world look like for our children, our great-grandchildren, for the future generation? And there was no plan for it. So even though we're talking about a climate change solution today, what I really see is this is the first step for our future, of make, making sure that we actually have a readiness plan forward. And that's what we're doing through INRI at the moment to make sure that we engage the stakeholder, people, whoever is you know, living in the village of Africa, to the corner of India, to London, wherever it is, that the conversations really become irrelevant. And we engage each and every person because the world just does not belong to the 10 people who sit in a really large boardroom and make the decisions. And I really look forward to um, talk about those solutions with all of my um, fellow panelists today. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Moon. Ben, uh, let's go to you. What is your opening statement here? Well, thank you very much. And again, uh, uh, very happy to be back at Harassus. And uh, I'm the CEO of Central Nick. We're a uh, technology company listed on the London Stock Exchange. And uh, we're not quite at the at the um, billion dollar size that 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 Moon is talking about her uh, the people she's been talking to, but we're halfway there this year, which is good because we were only at a couple of million dollars revenues when we first IPO'd. And um, you listed do, already on the good way. <laughs> and what we do is we provide uh, um, services to to people in almost every single country in the world, including partnering with enterprise, with government, and, 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 and obviously servicing entrepreneurs to give them the tools to get their business onto the internet or their organization, and then to win customers and earn revenues on the internet. And I guess we actually declared ourselves carbon neutral back when we were a very small country before, company before we IPO and it's been a long, hard road to get back there as we've grown so fast, but we have achieved that as of last year through a combination of uh, carbon credits, which we do pay for, and, uh, and carbon reduction that we've um, worked hard to achieve. And I guess my perspective is that, firstly, as a public company, we've seen a massive change in investor, um, in, in, in investor priorities, to, towards including environmental goals in in everything that we do, uh, which 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 we believe that tech companies can achieve. We know a lot of tech companies have you know developed a reputation as a having a you know the the carbon footprint of a Sasquatch, but that's not necessarily uh, um, uh, uh, part of being an important tech company, and. Um, and perhaps I should I should leave it there. I guess I'm I'm uh, here hoping to be a spokesman for uh, ethical big business. Very good. We will get back to that topic uh, in a moment. Frederic, uh, tell us your opening uh, statement. Well, thank you very much. I guess part part presentation, part opening statement. Um, well, I've I've been uh, investing in businesses for the last twenty five years. Uh, mainly in the consumer field, um, from food and beverage to healthcare services, business to business services and uh, education, um, and moved on to really apply my um, talent as uh, a growth and sustainability. And um, essentially, because I identified the climate urgency and the social urgency, and that the, the way uh, I could help was really to direct more capital towards sustainable businesses. Um, my investment thesis is that Europe is the place where we will see um, probably the, the tomorrow's leaders in sustainability because of the framework that the EU has put together, which will be followed by other, um, other nations for sure. And that's for the greater good of, of, of the planet. Um, my opening statement would be that um, we have seen slowness in the implementation of a lot of the um, COP26, um, I would say, thoughts and, and decisions. Um, and I think we're seeing today 
you know, an even greater doubt uh, with um, the war in, in, in Ukraine um, and to see that many companies and many governments uh, have many priorities to juggle with. Uh, I think all around this call, we are convinced about the urgency of, of climate, uh, but obviously this can take a, a backseat uh, to other priorities from time to time. I think it's our job and our, and our common interest to uh, find ways to keep that on top of the agenda because even if we are sort of hitting ourselves on the heads, uh, there's still an urgency that, um, that, that is there looming on, on the horizon and the, the number of years that we have, um, you know, has been counted and, and properly counted to, to, to restore the situation. Um, so um, competing priorities, let's do our best to uh, focus everybody's mind and, and poor capital in the places where it's going to have the best effect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frédéric. Kai, last but definitely not least. Thanks a lot, Martina, and nice meeting co-panelists and hello audience uh, from Germany. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really excited to be here uh, because there's so much energy on climate change and that's needed. Um, my energy uh, comes from a very personal moment, um, which was more than 10 years ago. It was the biggest failure in climate history. And I guess you all know what I talk about. It was the collapse of the Copenhagen Climate Summit. We all hoped for a new framework for the world, and it didn't happen. And I wondered why the heck is the biggest problem on earth? Everyone is in the room, no outcome. So I stopped working at Boston Consulting Group. I went back to my ideas from Harvard Kennedy School, where I did my master. And I'd go to London, Ben, to the London School of Economics and said, let's do a PhD and find out. The finding to me was a surprise because you can change the success of negotiations if you do it better. I was lucky because the French government invited me in 2014 with one question. How can we make Paris successful? The Paris mm -hmm. Climate Summit. So... I shared my insights from the fresh PhD from the LSE, um, and they built a lot of the strategy of the summit on these negotiation insights. And this is how we've been working with our center ever since. So the last summit we supported was Glasgow with Alok Sharma, the climate minister at the time. We all know him. And the organization we founded is the Center for Multilateral Negotiations. Thank you so much, Kai. It no took story. a PhD for you to, you know, really kick off and, and help and support those uh, negotiations, but it was definitely worth uh, the effort. And thank you so much uh, for going to the LSC for that and, uh, you know, helping uh, in the fight against climate change, uh, moving on from the BCT to uh, join the center. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to start actually with uh, this news topic, of course, uh, that we simply can't ignore. It's on all our minds uh, with Ukraine. Uh, crisis and, and um, the war there. I would like to ask, how is now this impacting the climate change? Is it accelerating because we have a, you know, energy crisis uh, in Europe and, and elsewhere and, and wheat prices skyrocketing? Or um, how do you see this whole situation um, accelerate uh, from here? Is it uh, putting a stop to the fight against climate change or actually accelerating? Who would like to take this question first? Um, I'm yes, happy to give two cents. <laughs> go ahead, go mm -hmm. ahead. Well, I, I, I honestly, I see um, three dimensions here. Um, the first is what you just said, Martina, and I see it in Germany in the news every day. It's a huge push to say, how can we be more independent from fossil energy coming from Russia these days, but also somewhere else? So it really accelerates the change to renewables. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think it puts a huge focus on, are, is nuclear energy really secure? If there are people in this world that are not rational, and there are, and we all know that I talk about it. And the third one is, I see a threat to the attention to climate change. And I guess we all see this. Yes. And so I think that must not happen. The release of the IPCC report this week 
was in the footnotes of the press. It should have been on the front page that the world is in danger. Yes, because of Putin, but also because of climate change. That is my view of it. Fantastic uh, point of view. Moon, you want to say something? Yes. Uh, thank you for covering this point. I think I would just like to add on top of that, the migration. I think so far almost one million Ukrainian people has already crossed the border. And I think we can expect this number to only grow in the coming days or weeks. Nobody really knows how long this war is actually going to last. And we know that migration has a huge impact on climate change. And, and this is going to take us back. Um, and I just want to really reiterate that when there is a war, it is on our face. And we're so worried that the climate change is not something that people are going to be able to so much focus on or give the attention or the finances to, because now we are more of a reactive mode as opposed to like a proactive mode, like, you know, where the funds should really go because, you know, people's are, you know, in front of us, our friends and our family and their families are in danger. So that will definitely set us back. That's what I think. Absolutely, because we were hoping that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic would be over and we could all focus our uh, resources on the fight against climate change. But now, who would have expected uh, the uh, Russian aggression uh, on the Ukraine and, and the war there as well? Um, what do you think, Ben, in terms of, uh, you know, taking away the focus uh, from climate change and, uh, you know, all eyes now on the uh, war in the Ukraine? Well, I think it, as uh, Kai pointed out, that um, uh, uh, the uh, accord, accords around climate involve uh, negotiation and agreed positions. And clearly, as, uh, as we saw with um, President Trump kind of uh, uh, removing the United States from the Paris Accord, uh, that political, political expediency with the short-term view tends all too often to... Um, to, to take over from a, from a long-term accord perspective. And, uh, and so I guess any divisiveness like this is uh, politically is absolutely no doubt going to flow through to, uh, to other important areas of policy as well, uh, which, which clearly is, is, is uh, very unfortunate, but we, we've, we've seen it happen time and time again. Yeah. Um, Frederick, we had a quick uh, preparation chat a few weeks ago. Um, you mentioned uh, the key trends when it comes to climate change investments as well. And of course, a lot of members on this panel today are also looking at uh, those and are maybe eager to network with you afterwards as well. There must be some synergies between all you panelists as well. Can you tell us a little, little bit which key trends you are seeing right now at uh, Planet First uh, Partners when it comes to investments into climate change? You point out that Europe is really in the front seat when it comes to that. Sure. Thank you, uh, uh, agreements. Sure, and I will tie this to the previous question as well because I think the the you know whereas on energy I see a clear push uh, towards alternative energies and, and, in, and, and independence from, from gas, of course, and, and the, the presence we receive uh, on the 31st of December for the inclusion of gas and nuclear in the, in the Article 9 or in the SFDR uh, was, was a, bit of a, um, a bit of a blow, I think, to everyone that was expecting to see um, greater independence. And, and, and I think it just goes to say uh, how much you know, political short-term priorities Uh, have been taken into account in some of these decisions. So I see, I see a great push towards uh, energy independence and alternative energies. But I think that on alternative foods, um, which, has, which has been a, a focus of attention for investors the last two years, um, and where valuations have gone up and down and, and may, maybe down in the last year or so, I think what's happening in, 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 in the East today Is, is, is basically going to distract even more of uh, alternative food. Because alternative food has obviously, a, it's mainly an impact uh, on, on uh, climate, um, but it's likely to take a, a second step to, compared to um, energy transition. Um, I think green cities will be still very high on the agenda of the local uh, politicians and the national politicians to have you know, basically clean cities. Um, in the case of the other themes, um, like uh, consumer health, um, circularity, um, or Industry 4.0, um, I think those will all take 
uh, at least in the next sort of two or three years, maybe a slight uh, back burner position to uh, energy transition. So I think energy transition is going to be pushed by recent events significantly. And so I would say, to answer your point, uh, that trend is going to be uh, looked at. And in fact, we, we made an investment in a, a green um, electrolyzer business in, in Germany, which is going to clearly benefit significantly from um, the evolution of um, the, the EU, uh, but also China and the US desire to reduce uh, energy dependency on, on gas. And, uh, and, and therefore, I think it's going to be a very, very interesting trend in the sustainable investment um, philosophy. Absolutely. Thank you, Frédéric. Uh, Sunday, of course, your business uh, and business model seem to be quite uh, bulletproof uh, because you're really investing into a, a future uh, industry that has so much potential, converting um, uh, waste uh, into energy and, and cement and so on. Um, yeah. Tell us uh, where you think the future of your business lies exactly and where you put all your resources and uh, efforts. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, let me quickly come back to what uh, some of the panelists have said before and your question towards uh, what the activities that is happening now around the globe. Our focus has now been shifted. We were just talking about COVID, that COVID has brought a lot of huge problems to our sectors in recycling uh, sectors. You understand renewable energy sectors whereby we have to deal with this heavy, costly waste they are sophisticated waste that uh, even the professionals are somehow afraid of. It gives a lot of problem because when you see some of the workers, they are really afraid to touch those gloves, those masks, those uh, lilac uh, uh, you use synthetic. for the op yes synthetic yeah. operations. So these are the things that I've, I would say as a really I would say slow down the 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 the, the pace into reaching our our goal. Actually, the goal of the, the whole universe, I would say, according to the COP26, is to reduce the global warming to 1.5 degree, which, which actually we are not expecting now because of the COVID. So it slowed down the system. And um, because of the war also in Ukraine, you can see that all those damages done to all those huge buildings, water are contaminated. You can see that the process has been slowed down it's been slowed down. So it's not an easy thing for us uh, in these sectors where we work with the renewable energy on recycling sectors. It's not so easy for us to move quickly as we have planned before. It's a big, it's a big, uh, I think you guys know everything I'm talking about here. It's not so easy for us. So we have to rethink. We have to rethink again and we have to set up another pace because it's a new thing actually to us now because Actually, Africa do experience what is happening now in Europe, in Ukraine and in Russia. We are used to this kind of situation because it happens a lot of time in Africa that government just fight each other. You have pushed there. It's not a story in Europe. So I'm somehow surprised that this is ringing alarm in Europe because we have a problem coming up in Ukraine now. I'm not discriminating, but I'm just trying to say, where are all these protests? When you have this case in Africa, it happens almost every two months, three months in Africa. It's forgotten world, you know. So as an African living in Europe, so I found myself, I started thinking, so are we humans or are we what? Nobody is talking about what is happening in Africa. So I said, I said, this is double moral, you know. This is double moral because for me, it's really tough when I, when I see kids dying every second because they don't have food. It's not a story here. Yeah. And you I'm know, they being European and currently in Africa, I can tell you this is exactly true. We have so many people here in Rwanda saying the same, like they do not want to have anything with Europe or the West to do anymore. They want to take matters into their own hands, like all the entrepreneurs and, and new businesses coming up, you know, e-scooters and, and recycling factories. They don't rely on other countries anymore because they don't trust them. So they just want to do it themselves now, which uh, obviously is understandable as well. But let's go back to um, the Paris Climate Change Agreement that you've briefly mentioned as well, Sunday. Who in this uh, panel thinks that we can actually still reach the climate change targets that were set in Paris a few years if I ago. Quickly, if I might quickly uh, answer that, I, I would yes. say 
yes and no. Okay. The, the reason for my two, two answer is basically based on the reason why uh, on the yes aspect, we have to be determined. Mm-hmm. We have to be determined and focused. We don't have to lose our focus. We have to be determined and focused no matter what the situation or the problem outside there. We just have to be focused, determined, and we have to walk. Not only on paper, we have to walk. Okay, my no is due to the situation around us now, you can see that a country with about six, seven, eight million, you cannot talk to them right now about climate change. They have other problems in their head. You cannot mm. talk to them about climate change. That means automatically you almost lost those areas there. So it's the kind of a thing I will, I will, I will just suggest that we just have to come together again, walk mm. together again, build the trust. Build the trust because to, to challenge trust the climate, climate change, Start from our home. Start from Absolutely. each person's home. We have to manage what we do. Manage. We don't need to. Uh, we have to mm-hmm. sew our clothes. We have to. You don't need to buy every time new clothes. You have to use Thank you, Sunday. Ones. Yes. Um, what <laughs> does uh, Kai think? Because you have been so involved in these negotiations yourself. Uh, are the Paris Climate Agreement targets uh, still reachable? Well, the optimist in me says yes. <laughs> but the, the, re- the, re- the realist says uh, we won't if we don't push harder. Yeah. Um, very, and I think we all know this. And the yeah. IPCC report put it for us black on white on paper. Yeah. yeah. And I think moving harder, um, it shouldn't be stereotypical, but it needs every one in every area of this world and on all levels. I just, mm-hmm. if I may, I want to highlight one level. And I think, um, Frederic, you said it. Frederic, you said Europe is quite advanced on this, uh, also the way I understood it, because of the European framework that was put in place, right, on carbon emissions. That framework did not fall from the sky. It was a result from a negotiation process on a state level. And if I may... Every single COP is important to produce these kind of frameworks that push investors and people in the right direction. So my, my pledges, don't forget Egypt. It's the next COP. Don't forget Dubai, the COP after. And we have to make sure that these COPs are as brilliant as possible. But they how need- many COPs do we still need? Martina, it's an ongoing process. Honestly, we need 30 more. But it's okay. The world keeps negotiating. It has negotiated for 2,000 years, and it will so for 2,000 more to come. You will what never run out of work. That's what for we sure. lack is we lack professional negotiators and facilitators. And I know this because I've been doing it for 10 years. <laughs> so that's my claim. Make it you more professional. You have to go on a hiring spree around the world uh, to universities. I and, am. Uh, Young talent. This is this is excellent. And um, Frederica, you are a, a realist or an optimist, or how do you uh, judge, you know, the current uh, state of affairs? I'm a, I'm an optimist. Um, I'm an optimist because I think uh, that there has never been a greater alignment uh, between business and sustainability, and that now that sustainability is a good investment. Um, paradigm, uh, it means that we're going to have more and more capital uh, going into sustainability, and that will make a change. I mean, until recently, you know, you're talking about an impact fund, people were yawning and saying, well, we don't want to have concessionary returns. We want to have real returns, and you know, it's fine, I will do my bit in my garden, but but I won't worry about where I'm getting my money from. Today, you can, you can make very good money out of investments in sustainability, It's something that we are not only convinced about, we're also convinced that the younger generations of entrepreneurs, or sons and daughters of entrepreneurs, who are distancing themselves from uh, the business because they probably have a greater sustainability fiber than a business fiber, can be reconnected with the business um, um, proposition and can uh, identify that there is a good opportunity to reconcile both in their own lives. And so I'm an optimist from that standpoint. And I think, uh, you know, the more investors will do 
uh, will we'll have great returns in sustainability, the more money will go into that sector. And that's what's, what's starting to happen. Yeah, it's not a buzzword anymore, but it's really in the DNA of uh, companies and the governments as well. This is really, really good. Uh, ben, uh, tell us um, about your point of view there uh, with sure. regards to Paris, but also like where, you know, the whole future um, is going to, to be at. Absolutely. Well, I'd really like to um, perhaps uh, 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 take a lead from Frederick and say that one of the things that, that seems very clear to me about the, 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 the COP uh, meetings is, is the virtual exclusion of business. Uh, um, and, and clearly business are the great polluters and business are the people that actually have to change what they do in order to, um, to achieve these goals. And so the reliance on regulation and the exclusion of business from the table and also if you're look, looking for professional negotiators, maybe that's a good place to look as well. Uh, I think the kind of large-scale ridiculing of Jeff Bezos's speech at the last COP and criticism of all the private jets and so on is really just kind of playing to the crowd Please. and completely ignoring the fact that um, without businesses support, none of this is going to happen. And, uh, and, and relying solely on regulation is, is clearly a mistake when a multilateral uh, approach could be far more successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Moon, uh, what uh, Gina, you, yes? you said it should be interactive, if I may. One question. Yes, ben. Great. Thank you, Ben. Um, I have a question. How, from your perspective, my experience is business knows too little about that, too little about climate negotiations, about climate change to have more impact. My question would be, what would you say? How can you bring it closer to business, that knowledge, that expertise? Well, it certainly sounds like, um, I mean, this is exactly the area that Moon is working in, right, is, is, to, is to bring it home to business. So she may well have uh, uh, more knowledge than I do around this. But th there are certainly examples of, like, like uh, um, uh, we work in the internet infrastructure area and the governing bodies there are multi-stakeholder. They involve government, they involve uh, 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 business, they involve uh, uh, um, law enforcement, and they involve uh, academics and research and so on. Um, and essentially, the internet is a one of these rare examples where it's, it, it's all private enterprises keeping the internet going, but it's one internet that it works for everybody. I mean, we'll see if it survives the current, the, you know, the current war. But um, uh, so I think there are working examples of how to pull it together. And I'm not saying it's a model of efficiency. It's not. But uh, I think there's a presumption that, that, that business can't, uh, um, can't contribute in a way that isn't solely focused yeah. on making money. But clearly, as we know, and we've heard eloquently from Frederick, that's not the case at all um, in terms of the priorities of, uh, of, of business today. I think you should all definitely uh, hook up after that and, and connect and see how we could, you know, launch successful um, negotiations and, and really push uh, the un envelope a bit further. Uh, Moon, what is your reaction to that? How would you maybe a be able to help? Um, thank you for asking that question. So what we felt, you know, just a very recent report by PwC, it shows a staggering number of almost... 94% people currently um, until up to the age of 55 cares about the ESG metrics that they did not know before. Um, and that number has gone up significantly compared to last five years ago. So what I see from the businesses and where the disconnect is, um, and Kai, I totally agree with you that we do need COP26, but the difficulty is who goes to COP26? It's maybe people like yourself are really high ranking officials and they're just sitting there and making decisions in silos. But let's become, even though, but I'm just saying it's not a wrong. What I'm saying is another way of how do you put pressure on brands? Because the way normal people can influence the business decisions very strategically is with their wallet. You know, how do they decide to actually spend their money? 
right? Like right now, a lot of the company like BP has sold their stake in Russia. They are showing their power of what's right and what's not right. And we're not going to stand with it. Similar way, what we are trying to do is actually helping brands to come up with their ESG metrics and communicate that per product physical basis that if you purchase this jacket versus that mug then out of a 10 score what type of ESG metric this brand is actually carrying and then you will be rewarded based on the type of decisions you made so you know it's a positive re reinforcement of our behavior that you know it's no longer like a feel-good thing but you're doing something and you're being rewarded for them and this way, and I don't say, you know, it's going to be achieved over one year, but definitely on a long-term situation, brands need to be able to figure out a way, companies need to be able to figure out a way to give the correct and transparent number to their stakeholder. And because once they have the data and from a very neutral point of view, and they can also talk to their customers that, hey, we know that we had to increase the price for this, but this is for the betterment of the society, the betterments of the climate. And we want to make sure that we're taking an entire holistic approach, which makes business decision, but this is good for everybody. So if we I may, if I may compliment. Frederick, please go ahead. Yes, yes. If I may compliment, th th thank you for that comment. And I think it uh, points to um, an element of the framework that is really interesting coming from the EU, which is the financial directive. And the financial directive is very cleverly um, created uh, for all financing activities, a number of sectors which are acceptable or not acceptable. Um, for banks, for uh, investment funds, for insurance companies, for LPs. So you have now a, a very large body of the financial assets that have to be classified according to how high they are in terms of ESG. And of course, the last thing that an insurance company wants to be looking like is to be to, to have a, a poor scoring on ESG. And so the highest level being Article 9, and then 8, 6, 4, and then basically being ESG. And that framework is really pushing money in the right direction. And so it's, it's going to happen uh, very quickly. In addition to that, industry has a limited number of carbon um, uh, credits which it can use, and that limited number gets smaller and smaller year after year. So this is Europe. This is not happening elsewhere in the world at the moment, but this is why we are so convinced that there is an opportunity in Europe to that this framework is accelerating champions to thrive in climate technologies and to actually be leaders in, you know, world leaders um, in those technologies, having been given this boost by the financing framework and the CO2 framework. Mm. Do you think, Ben, that uh, this is a catalyst uh, enough for other countries and companies to follow? Well, I guess clearly um, uh, uh, Europe has a tradition of being a leader in this space, but... Um, but if, if one looks at particular industries and so on, you can see, and particularly as, it, as, as uh, Frederick is mentioning, it, it's aligning business with the priorities of investment too. I think we'll absolutely be seeing this, um, this kind of approach coming uh, increasingly from, um, from, from China, for instance, um, and and um, and with the political changes in the United States, perhaps uh, um, we'll see it being picked up more there. I think we certainly are already. So, um, so so I, I guess the short answer is yes. Okay. I would like to open uh, the floor uh, to questions as well uh, from the audience. If Jesse, Nicholas, Marin have any questions, please uh, feel free to jump in, raise your hand, uh, and I can let you into the room, or you can also drop a message uh, in the comments uh, tab there um, to ask uh, a question. Um, now, obviously, we uh, want to also um, make sure that we can address, uh, you know, an organization's inertia in the long term and really make sure that we come up with uh, these long term solutions. Now, what concretely, uh, Sunday, uh, should a company like you or what are you doing in practice, right, to really avoid that there is any sort of inertia? Yeah, uh, the, the, it's a kind of a, a, a big complicated issue because okay. Frederick said something before uh, about the 
uh, the financial sector, which is very, very important. So I think, I believe, because Europe, as you said, is the powerhouse of this, this magnet, uh, financial magnet. So I believe this should be extended also to, to, I would say, the third world, as you always said, should be extended to the third world and also open up the market but it should be a simple technology because they tell, uh, they, they, uh, Europe and America, or whatsoever you call them, they have to understand how things work in Africa. I think you know this yourself because you found that the trade on, in Africa is almost on the street. Most of them don't have bank accounts. They don't have bank accounts. So you just deal hand to hand. So if we want to extend this financial, uh, I would say, grace to Africa, it should be something that we, we are trying to practice that because we try to help small traders. Mm-hmm. Small traders, we try to teach them, we develop a system, a mechanism called the green police. What is the green police? The green police are people that we, we trained and try to sell them street by street. So you have this street, the street, this street name is maybe uh, Frederick Street, so it's about 100 houses. So the Green Police, their, their work is to go from houses to houses to educate these people how to manage their resources. Managing resources mean to do less with the energy, mm-hmm. try to, to, to put on things that you use yesterday and not just throw them away just like that. So to reproduce, we are talking about recycling. And most of these mm-hmm. uh, small trade traders they lack this fund. That's why I'm trying, we are mm-hmm. I'm suggesting if there's any way investors can come in or government can come in and create a fund, a small fund where you can give them little credit that they can pay back without pain so that they don't Absolutely. feel this pain. It will really work. Yeah. That is the way to help Africa uh, or, or Asia or whosoever needs this help because you teach them how to fish and you just don't give them the fish every time. That's exactly what Julius Nyerer said uh, a few decades ago already, isn't it? Now we have one question and I'm afraid we already have to wrap it up after that because we only have three minutes uh, to go. Uh, this comes from Nicholas Johnson. He's the CEO at uh, Economist Without Borders. Um, he mentioned that uh, he would like to get some thoughts from you on risk averseness. Um, at uh, the individual level among company executives who are afraid to make a substantial change in company direction. Um, who would like to take this question? Maybe one of the CEOs here in the room, maybe Ben? Or sure, Jordan? sure. I'd, I'd be happy to. I'd, I'd say it's quite, in a way, I would say it's quite the opposite. It's very clear now, especially in a uh, listed environment in the UK, that not taking ESG priority seriously is, is is the risky strategy. Um, it, it, it puts you in a disalignment with the majority of investment funds, uh, which which obviously is a bad place to be, as well as, um, uh, 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 you know, it, it puts you in disalignment in general with your staff as well, who obviously are, uh, are no matter where they are in the world, are generally... Uh, uh, educated about these matters and they don't want to work for a company that is polluting, destroying the environment and taking climate change in the wrong direction. So um, I would say the risk of her stance is to take SG very seriously indeed. Absolutely. Uh, last question from us uh, comes from Marin. Um, she works um, at uh, Semun uh, as well with Kay, I guess. Um, Frederick mentioned the massive change in investor priorities. How do small and medium-sized companies manage this transformation? Could you maybe share your insight on that, Frédéric? Yes, I think, um, well, we, we focus on companies that are the transformative agents. They are the ones bringing the technology to the rest of the world. So they will be the ones used by those companies that are maybe of a slightly older model of economic uh, reality, including um, all the um, sort of consumption of energy um, to use the technology. So I think uh, technology is where the answer is going to be very often. Um, and if I may just answer uh, Ben's comment on the role of the CEO, I think it's by being inspiring for young leaders uh, and young talent that you make a change. And I can see that, you know, I have decided to start Planet First Partners two years ago. And I've been very humbled by the fact that 
people of very high caliber, very high talent have decided to join us very much because of the mission. Um, of course, uh, and, and, and that makes a big difference. And as a CEO, that is how you can make a big change uh, in society is by bringing in and being inspiring with the right message and the right um, uh, priorities for your business. Mm. And you all definitely made a big impact in society, in the world, and have a huge purpose. So thank you all very much. We have already reached the end of our panel. So we had a very limited audience size, uh, but I'm not disappointed because I'm sure that with the full house that we had on the panel, you can interact and uh, you can work together. I'm sure there are so many different challenges that we can confront together in this fight against climate change. And I look very forward to staying in touch with you. Take care. Thank you, Thank Thank you so you. much, everybody. Have a nice rest of your day. Bye-bye. 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 Keep in touch. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Cheers.